Welcome to Spindale United Methodist Church. Hello church family, friends, and those watching on Facebook and YouTube. I have some announcements today. Favorite verses. Are you willing to share a brief one minute explanation of your favorite Bible verse and why? We would like to share these brief clips along with our online service. Please contact the church office to make your appointment. Administrative Council will meet this afternoon at 4.30 p.m. at the church. drive through Community Meal. We will host a drive through meal on Wednesday, January the 20th at 5 p.m. We will begin preparation at 2 p.m. Contact Bill McDaniel if you can help. We need volunteers to make a pot of soup of your choice. Be sure to check your email for our weekly e-news for a full list of announcements. If you are not receiving the e-news, please let the church office know. Will you join me now in prayer? Lord, we welcome your presence with us today as we focus our thoughts, prayers, and praises towards you. May we open our hearts and minds to your teachings and our plans and hands in your work in the community. Make us aware of those who are grieving, sick, hungry, naked, and imprisoned, and empower our service of love to them as you have asked. For we ask in your holy name. Amen.
Well, good morning and welcome back to our sermon series called uh, So You Want to Be a Disciple, where what we're doing is talking about what it means to not just be a Christian, because Christian can be so open-ended as far as the definition goes, but more specifically what it means to, to be or to live into being what uh, are a, a disciple of Christ. And so if you're following along in your Bibles, this is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture, but this is found in Luke chapter 24. And it's a very powerful story that takes a look at two guys who just three days removed from Jesus' death are simply walking along and, and having a conversation when suddenly they're joined by God himself, Jesus. But, as we'll see in our reading in this moment for various reasons, these two guys didn't even recognize this person who was with them being Jesus, whom they'd come to know as the Messiah. So they were very familiar with him, yet they didn't recognize him. So this is uh, starting Luke chapter 24, verses 13 and 14. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now, what are these guys uh, talking about here? Well, what they're talking about is just how three days prior to this, this guy named Jesus had been crucified on a Roman cross, basically for his claims of being the Messiah. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because for centuries there had been stories and prophecies and rumors about how one day God would send this Messiah to save his, his people or the Jewish people. And so for these two guys, while sitting around the family table and beyond probably, they had certainly heard about this coming Messiah from their parents or grandparents, their friends and other Jewish leaders in the community, etc. And so as far back as they can remember, these two guys along with their families and all the other Jewish people in the Jewish diaspora, they'd been hoping and expecting and dreaming and praying for the day that this Messiah would actually come and save the Jewish people. But then after years and years uh, and years of, uh, of their dreams and expectations and hopes just being dashed, one day this guy named Jesus shows up. And even though he didn't appear to be very regal or majestic or warrior-like, really, in fact, <laughs> judging by his mere appearance, he looked more like a shepherd than he did a, than, did a king. But regardless of his rather plain and humble external appearance, it was undeniable that there was something different about this guy named Jesus. You see, during this time in Palestine, these two guys, along with many others, had not only witnessed the miracles of this guy named Jesus, the healing of the sick, the raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, and feeding multitudes of people with very little, but also along with that, Jesus had also shown that time and time again how much the common man meant to him. In fact, for Jesus, unlike the privileged Jewish people of his day, he didn't gauge a person's worth based on their social or economic status or their professional or religious titles or even how much money they had in their, in their wallets. But rather for Jesus, the things that really moved the needle of his heart were based solely on the greatest commandment as defined by Jesus, which is to love God and love others with all your umph, really, which in turn made Jesus if you think about it, different than any other leader, king, judge, or messiah wannabe that the Jewish people had ever met. And so as these two guys specifically witnessed the miracles, his approach to people in faith, his desire for peace, and how when he spoke things actually happened and lives were changed, they thought he could be the one. This could actually be the messiah this time. But then after all this time, after years and years of praying and wishing and dreaming about finally meeting the one, finally having the Messiah come here, the guy who would deliver them from this present day oppression that they were experiencing, all of a sudden that came crashing down just three days prior to this walk as they witnessed this rabbi, this miracle worker and peaceful man of God, their Messiah, as they, had, as they witnessed Jesus being nailed to a Roman cross and crucified as a criminal. All that stuff that they had hoped for was gone. And so it was on that day that all their hopes and dreams actually, if you think about it, kind of died with them. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say that perhaps for some of you, 
you can understand a great deal about what these two were going through in this moment, how they felt. I mean, maybe for you, you got a bad report from the doctor recently, or perhaps you're experiencing some kind of chronic pain in the present that you just can't get away from, or you just can't escape it. Or maybe for you, the social distancing and gathering restrictions um, from COVID-19 pan uh, COVID pandemic, that's really hit you psychologically, and, and you're, the loneliness and alienation that you're feeling, you can't get away from that. Or maybe for you, just about like everyone else in this country now, the, the political chaos and mayhem and unrest and, and a possible civil war that could happen from what we're, we're watching on the news now has left you feeling lost and angry and scared, polarized really, or even hopeless. And so much like these two guys walking along this dusty path, perhaps right now in the season of your life, you too feel a bit lost and scared and disoriented, unsettled, whatever, because you're not real sure how all this is going to end. This is what verses 15 and 16 say. As they talked and discussed these sayings with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, it's, it's interesting, uh, one of the interesting things about this passage is that it says they, these two guys who obviously knew who Jesus was, they were kept from recognizing him. Now, this is kind of a thing we see in Scripture from time to time, and it makes you wonder, kind of pause in the moment and say, why would God do that? Why would God keep them from recognizing or, or seeing him? Well, perhaps what we have here is in some, what some would call a teachable moment where God was thinking, I, I need to teach you something before I reveal myself to you. Uh, I need you to really see and understand what it means to be a disciple of Christ before we go further. Kind of like we talked about last week where God anticipates or expects us to do one thing before other things are revealed to us. So it's kind of along those same lines. You see, many times in our life, the answer to the very thing that we're looking for can get lost in the haze of all the things that, that are going on all around us, really which in turn can distract us and keep us from recognizing what's really going on in that moment. It kind of reminds me way back in my, in my bachelor days, uh, in, in, in my early 20s, I had this oven that, that uh, had been there when I bought the house. It was kind of an older oven, so one day I went to turn it on, and it didn't turn on. It wouldn't turn on. So I kept turning the knobs. Maybe I was doing that wrong or whatever, and, and, I, and I was checking the wires underneath. I was doing those kind of things. I think I even kicked it one time didn't work. So I was like, okay, well, it's just time to bite the bullet and go buy another oven. So I did. I went to, to Lowe's or wherever I went. I may, may, may have been Sears. I think Sears was around still at, at that point in time. So I'll go out and spend $450, I believe it was, on this oven. And I put it in, do all the wiring and all that. And I'm very proud of myself, you know, of, of, of doing this, buying this new oven, replacing it, and doing such a great job of all that. Uh, humility also is, is, is a part of this story. But I, I, so I put it in, and then I turned the knob, and guess what? Nothing happened. And then I thought, I saw my dad's face kind of like looming in the room going, before you do anything major like that, especially if it's electrical, make sure you check the fuse. I hadn't checked the fuse. I checked the fuse in. It was the fuse that was out. There was nothing wrong with the oven before, and there was nothing wrong with this oven. It's just something that I didn't see something that I, I missed. You see, for me, because I was so emotionally distraught in this moment, I didn't see or couldn't see what was really going on right in front of me, really. I mean, it was there, it was in my sights, but I didn't see it. And really, that's what's going on here with these two guys who were walking along with Jesus. Because based on their feelings of devastation and hopelessness, they are oblivious to what is actually going on in this scenario. Let's continue with verse uh, 17 and 18. Jesus says this, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that happened there in these days? Now, no doubt this is an understandable dose of sarcasm from these two because for them they had to be thinking uh, along the lines of how is it that you don't know what's going on here? How are you the only one around that doesn't know what just happened uh, on Calvary? How how would you miss this? Because this guy named Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah, well guess what? He's dead. They killed him. He is no more. But you know, even with that said, 
Sometimes I wonder exactly what was going on inside of Jesus' mind at this point. I mean, maybe he was thinking, guys, I know in this moment that you don't recognize me, but try and remember, go back, if you will, rewind the tape, and try and remember what it is that I told you. I mean, remember when I told you that I was going to die, but three, laters, three days later I was going to come back? And how I told you that my Father, God, sent me here on a mission. And even though it was going to be tough, and Satan was going to tempt me, I stayed strong. And in the garden, how I was hesitant because I was anticipating the pain that would lie ahead. But how I looked up at my Father in heaven and said, Dad, if there's any way to get out of this, I'm listening. But not my will, but your will be done. And so I prayed it, and I lived it, and then they arrested me, and they spat on me, and they mocked me, and then they beat me, and they beat me, and they beat me, but I didn't give up. Why? Well, because I love you, and I love all humanity. And each time they whipped me, I was thinking, this one is for you, and this one is for you, and for you. You're going to be healed by the stripes that I have on my body right now. And so each time I cried out, I remember that I was doing this for you, for everyone here, for everyone who's ever been born or will be born. I did it for you and for the glory of my Father in heaven. And then they drove these metal stakes through my wrist and my feet, and oh my gosh, it hurt so much. And I cried out as they lifted me up on this cross. And you know, all the while this was happening, I knew that at any moment with one word I could play the God card and call legions of of angels down here and go Metallica on them and just kill them all. But I didn't do that. I stayed the course. And then the most painful thing I experienced was when I, I became sin for all mankind. And my father couldn't even look upon me at that moment. He actually turned away. And then I yelled out, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so then as I felt my physical life slipping away, I prayed to my Father in heaven and said, Dad, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then I died, and the whole world shook. Now, it could have ended right there, but it didn't, because the story was far from over at that point. No, in fact, it was just the beginning, because three days later, said Jesus, I walked out of that grave, and I defeated Satan. And because of the blood I shed on that old rugged cross, Satan no longer has the, the key to death. I mean, he may still bark and make a lot of noise, but I'll tell you right now, because of what I did for you and everyone else on that cross, everything that Satan says from this point moving forward is really just chin music. It's nothing, nothing more than that. You see, because I have risen, now you are forgiven. And since you are forgiven, if you choose to be my disciple and follow me, change your old ways and follow me, you will always have a chair at my Father's table. You see, these two guys, like many of us, were downcast. In truth, they were hurting, alone, confused, and afraid. And again, like many of us, they didn't even realize that the source of true life, Jesus Christ, was right there with them in that moment but they just couldn't see, they just couldn't recognize that it was him. This is what verses 19 through 21 says. What things are you talking about, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. And then in verse 20 it says this, the plot kind of turns. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him, but we had hoped we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more is that it is the third day since all of this took place. Now, I want to kind of hang on those words right there for a moment, but we had hoped. Because for some of you right now, maybe you're in a season of, but I had hoped. Or maybe you're thinking, but I had hoped that this, this virus would be gone by now and that I could be able to see my friends and family once again, I'm very lonely in this season. Or that my spouse would still be here so that I wouldn't be alone. Or that I could enjoy my retirement without this pain or this illness that's in my life right now. Or that this nation would actually pull itself together and find unity one more time. But I had hoped. But it didn't happen. And this is where these guys are right now. The story continues in verse 22 and 24. It says, in addition, some of, the, some of our women 
amazed us. Now, all the men out there, I want you to repeat this with me. Some of our women amazed us. You're welcome. Gratis. Practice that. You'll thank me later, okay? They, the women, went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us, told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. So in review, Jesus had risen, but they could not find him. The tomb was empty, but they did not see him. And even though he was with them, walking along with them right there, they didn't recognize him. You see, far too often, that, that actually far too more often than I would like to admit, when God is right there with me, doing the most in my life, those are the moments that oftentimes I'm the most distracted and miss the fact that he's there with me. I'm suspicious that others are, uh, that agree with me or do the same, do likewise. And so you see, a lot of the time when we get so bogged down with the negatives or the bad things that are going on in our lives, the circumstances or whatever, our faith walk or our life in general with God can appear to be nothing more than anarchy or chaos or a bunch of random non-related events that are just kind of all smashing into each other arbitrarily. But later, when we look back at those moments we shared with God through our new spiritual eyes, we talked about that last week with Paul. When we look at these things through our new spiritual eyes, well, then we can see how our life looks more like a finely crafted novel with cohesion and grace and poetry, poetry much more than the anarchy or the randomness or the chaos that we originally thought. Yeah, you see, it's in those moments when we're a little further down the road, or what is known as kairos moments in Greek, that we can see how God was walking with us the entire time, doing a good work in our life and making sense and giving purpose to each, each step that we take. And so here's my favorite part as we wind down. I'm a little excited today. And so here, here's my favorite part of the story found in uh, verse 29 and then 31. It says, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. That's Jesus, obviously, we're talking about. And I'm sure that kind of sounds familiar to most of you. Verse 31, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and then he disappeared from their sight. Now, let's just try to imagine, if we will, just follow along with me on this. Try to imagine what that probably looked like. I mean, here are these guys uh, and, and who are more than likely very familiar with the Last Supper. And so they're sitting at the table with Jesus, and he picks up the bread, and he gives thanks, and he breaks it, and he might have even said, this is my body, which was broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then perhaps he picks up the cup and says, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it. And then all of a sudden, like a slap to the face, these two guys finally start to figure out the parts of the story that earlier were just kind of like warbled or, or nebulous mess uh, of unknowns, really. But now, the front, por por li front porch light has just come on, and they start to think about what Jesus said, and they're thinking, wait a second, he was beaten and mocked and spat upon. And then they nailed him to a cross where he died, but then on the third day, he came back. He would rise again. Oh my goodness! That was Jesus. Jesus was with us the entire time. How in the world did we miss this? You see, I won't pretend to say I know where your faith walk is. But for me, through all the events of my life that appeared to be unrelated and arbitrary at the time, I can now see that during all those moments that Jesus was actually there with me. And for me and and, 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 and all these situations, I could see now, as I look back, how Jesus was busy at work. For example, when I rebelled in my teens and in my 20s and in half of my 30s, Jesus never left my side. He was there. And when I became sick and tired of being sick and tired and then fell on my knees in his presence, a broken man, but then rose up from that after I'd given my life to Christ, and when I rose up as a new man on the other side of that, Jesus was right there with me. And when I entered ministry and had to find balance with a, with a full-time job, a very sick wife, being a father and going back to college in my 30s, when well, Jesus was right there, right there with me saying, you can do this, you can do this. 
And then later when my wife, my, my rock, my biggest cheerleader, passed away, and I had to explain to my eight-year-old son how he wouldn't see his mom again in this lifetime, but he would later, Jesus never left my side. And then later when I met my wife, Sabra, who was crazy about Jesus in every way imaginable. And then we got married and our families got bigger and more diverse. God was right there with the big old God hug and he was right there with me. You see, for me, I can see Jesus at work in the past because I have eyes to see him now in the present. And now, just to be totally honest with you, I can see Jesus everywhere. I can see Jesus working in the most mundane of tasks that maybe could be missed if we just have regular physical eyes. We have to see him with our spiritual eyes. You see, I, I see Jesus in, in my wife. I see Jesus in my children. I see him in my failures as he rebuilds me and reshapes me to be more like him. And I can see him in this church as he continues to challenge every single one of us to love God with all of our oomph and to love and serve this world and each other as well. You see, being a disciple of Christ means that we have these new spiritual eyes. And because we now have new eyes and see things more like Christ sees things, well then as his disciples, we are called to act more like Christ in the way that we treat each other and spend time with each other and stand in the gap for each other and most especially love each other. Will you pray with me? Most Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your love and your example. We thank you for your grace. Lord, this is a story that speaks to us on so many different levels, but I, I would dare say there are others that are listening today who are just like me, that where Jesus is busy at work, he's doing all this around us, uh, trying to help us see a, see a better way, that we not only don't recognize uh, his presence, um, but we, we forget sometimes that we have new spiritual eyes to do so. That if we looked at the situation that we're in, step back, maybe took a breath, said a prayer, that we could see where Jesus is right there in the details. I pray that as we're learning more and more about what it means to be one of Jesus' disciples, that we take this lesson here to heart. And understanding that I, life's not always going to go our way. There's going to be tragedy. There are going to be things that we wish never happened. But God will never leave us or forsake us. God will always be there in the details of our lives. Matter of fact, in those moments that break our heart more than anything else, it breaks God's heart more than it breaks our heart. That's how much he loves us. And so as Jesus is right there with us in these moments, as God's Holy Spirit is working in our lives, it's time for us sometimes, I, I would dare say all times, to just, just be in that moment. Be in that moment and experience the risen Lord. See this world, see other people, even though they may anger us, even though they may, they, they may, you know, say whatever, some things that we don't like. We look at them with the same eyes that Jesus looks at us, and that makes all the difference in, in the world. So, Lord, I pray that we have, through these new eyes, we see things differently. We see people the way you see people. And we understand this grace is not just for us, but it's something that we should be giving back to other people as we love them in this community, in this world, in our households, every single place we go. Of course, in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. God bless and have a great week. As we gather here together in this holy place, May we sense your presence and amazing grace as we worship and adore you, bowing here before you. May your love and love flow through us, Lord, teaching us, cleansing us. And adore you, we bow before you. Bind your hearts together, make us one. All bind us together, bind your hearts together with sword that cannot be broken. Oh
Pray. We pray.